So, uh, obviously, I'm in a different environment today. We had a complete meltdown in our uh, internet today. So, I run down to my medical office. This is where I practice medicine. And uh, we have Wi-Fi here. And so, I... We the show must go on. We I'm very anxious to talk to Mike Benz, and so um, Susan had a great idea that I should run down here and just set up a computer, and I'll zoom in much the way Mike has zoomed in. And uh, Caleb is still in command of the ship in Alabama, and uh, hopefully we can get on with the show from here. I'll be watching you on restream as I always do. I can link right on into that. I apologize if there are any uh, glitches or anything in this in the process, but because uh, first time we've really done this, so. Uh, also, you'll notice the lighting is a little different without our NAND lights in there. Uh, the NAND lights really make a huge difference, and we appreciate their uh, participation with our... Uh, after Mike Benz, there it is. After Mike Benz, we're going to speak with Anthony Brown, a friend who had made it off the streets as a homeless person, now as a nurse and a nurse manager, and now he's setting up his own treatment centers. I want to promote what he's doing. So, Mike Benz, after this. Our laws, as it pertains to substances, are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin. Ridiculous. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying. You go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. You asked for it and the wellness company has delivered. The medical emergency kit, replete with ivermectin, prescription antibiotics, and more, continues to fly off the shelves. We keep one here at home. And there are three new kits you need to know about, and more are coming. The Contagion Emergency Kit was inspired by the high demand for the medical kits. In that Contagion kit, you'll find ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, antibiotics, budesonide, and a nebulizer. And a must for your next trip is the Travel Emergency Kit, something I made sure exactly what I give my patients is in this kit and some more. The kit includes remedies for jet lag, a variety of infections, even GI ailments. Imagine your flight getting grounded anywhere, say even in the U.S., and you start getting sick. You do not want to be at the mercy of of the U.S. healthcare system or any healthcare system. At home, we keep the ultimate first aid kit on hand. It has over 20 essential supplies and medications for situations when time is of the essence. Order one for your car and your go bag. Because these kits contain prescriptions, your purchase includes a telemedicine consultation as well as an instruction manual. Go to doctor.com slash TWC for 10% off. That is drdrew.com slash TWC for 10% off all your orders. I'm very excited about these kids. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC. Quick, uh, quick coda on that. Uh, I don't know if you've heard, but avian flu is coming. The World Health Organization has to create a vaccine against a flu that has been around since the mid-90s and has now infected exactly, <laughs> exactly one human. One human. One human and zero human-to-human -human transmission. So if you start hearing that there is rapid human-to-human -human transmission, that means that they have screwed with that virus and they have messed with the gain of function and all of a sudden we do have a problem. So, just wanted to take this moment to say at the wellness company, we take that seriously. And so we've added a broad spectrum antiviral Tamiflu to our Contagion kit. It's good against other flus as well. You have to take it early, but it's actually been shown to be quite a useful against the avian flu. So should it come around, uh, which is only if they're doing gain of function, that's the only way it's going to come around. So if you see that happening, you know what's up. All right. So Mike Benz is back. Uh, he's the founder of uh, Foundation for Freedom Online, free speech watchdog dedicated to restoring the promise of free speech in this country. Uh, he was a State Department cyber official in the Trump administration, and he is been very popular uh, in social media these days with his videos about the blob. Mike, welcome to the program. Welcome back, I should say. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to talking. So, uh, amongst other things, uh, I, I, you know, we open with this avian flu thing. Uh, I, I'm of the opinion that there's no way this thing has zero potential, has zero evidence of human to human transmission. So if it suddenly becomes rapidly transmissible amongst humans, to me, that means they're messing with it in the bio lab. Should we be thinking that way? 
I think at this point, you basically have to start from the assumption that something that's going to be deemed by our national security state or foreign policy establishment to be a pandemic has some sort of roots in a juiced up gain of function uh, type, you know, explosion of its of its potential pandemic power. You know, we've seen so much evidence of this, not just from the latest pandemic in COVID, but you know, frankly, dating all the way back to Lyme disease and the evolution of of bio warfare, and the, frankly, the utility of pandemics to give a license for the national security state to descend on countries around the world and form a kind of para governance structure. There, we saw that with with AIDS and other pandemics as a way to get a sort of boot heel uh, in a sort of toehold in in governments that were previously boxing us out. Once you have a public health predicate to do to put military boots on the ground, those military boots never leave. There was a very strange role of, for example, vaccine clinics in uh, in Central Asia. The, the time when we were chasing Osama bin Laden, the CIA was setting up vaccine clinics to be able to collect the biometrics of insurgent groups in the region. Uh, you know, there's a lot of crossover between the, the security state and uh, in the field of weaponized biology, you know, this is why where this new phrase around the biosecurity state really, really comes in. And w- we're living in an age where I don't think that you can trust uh, trust the government exactly to to tell you faithfully what they're doing in their own classified labs. Yeah, yeah, I I would like to. I'm, I'm sort of curious why a government by and for the people suddenly can't trust its own. Consti- can't the the government can't trust the constituents it seems and the, certainly constituents can't even get any information out of the government is it is it just that the bureaucracy has become so profoundly enlarged and 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 uh, such a blob and not and I'm not just talking about the national security state the whole thing is a blob that doesn't have values doesn't have morality doesn't change direction doesn't say I'm sorry doesn't say I'm wrong it just it just rolls along. Is is that what has happened to us? Yeah, well, I'd say it has it has interests rather than than ideology, and it chases those interests, you know, ruthlessly. And in this case, I tend to follow the censorship side because that's my sort of technical expertise on this. I don't have a you know biomedical background on these things, but you know what really troubled me so much about the COVID story was the very first censorship mercenary firms to descend on the internet, both in the US and around the world, all had very deep ties to the Pentagon and to the Central Intelligence Agency. And I can go list by list through who all of those were and what the timeline chronology was for how they predated the censorship done by all the other institutions by months. And you know, essentially came from the same psychological warfare uh, side of winning hearts and minds that our CIA and Pentagon do to try to sway insurgency groups uh, towards you know towards the U.S. cause. They were basically deployed to be able to um, create citizen buy-in to uh, to what what became our COVID response. So propaganda, we're talking about, right? I mean, that's really what's ultimately the the sort of the. I, I'll, I'll let you refine it if there's something different, but but I, I talked to Matthias Desmond yesterday, and it was a fascinating conversation. And uh, he was saying, I want to just frame it, just sketch it a little bit, that with the reduction in religion, we see the increase in narcissistic traits in human beings. And narcissism promotes envy and grievance. Uh, on one hand, envy and grievance is what these the blob is sort of capitalizing on. On the other is fear. So what I'm wondering is, should we be teaching people to understand that when they see the press, the government, the post, the blob, using fear or grievance as a way to try to get our buy-in, shouldn't we immediately think, oh, it's propaganda? Don't we have to educate people about that? Oh, of course. I mean, this is what a lot of the censorship, you know, I see censorship as being the flip side of propaganda. Propaganda is the knob upturning of the volume of a government message. Censorship is the knob downturning of any of any counter messaging. And yeah. until the social media censorship expanded AI toolkit was really unveiled uh, starting after the 2016 election here in the U.S., there really was no ability to do censorship at mass scale in a peer-to-peer way. 
You, know, you had famous examples of of censorship in the 20th century where you know JFK basically gave command orders to the mainstream media not to re- not to report certain things about the Cuban Missile Crisis when it looked like we were on the verge of World War III in 1961. But you, they couldn't reach into the dinner table conversations of 300 million Americans and just turn down their volume if they uh, start talking about a key phrase like lab leak. And, you know, so so in, in this case, you know, I do see the censorship weapon as being actually uh, a lot worse than just propaganda because propaganda still allows people to have a fighting chance against it if they simply don't believe it or the institutions lose so much credibility that when they see a propaganda poster, they roll their eyes and say, well, that means nothing to me and it means nothing to my friends or my clergy. So, yeah, but the, the issue here is, is the... Exactly what you identified around fear is was part of the censorship scheme. You see, the way they censored COVID, and when I say they, I mean these Pentagon and CIA and State Department cutouts like Graphica, like the Atlantic Council, like the Stanford Air and Observatory, like the University of Washington, were all staffed by former CIA or former DOD or former state folks. They they basically censored anything that might quote undermine public faith and support for the severity of the virus and the government's response to it. So for example, you know, the Department of Homeland Security's Cyber Security Division, which was their censorship division, but they simply said any mis dis or malinformation about COVID is a cyber attack because it's speech online that attacks a critical government response. This is why the Cyber Security uh, Task Force was was censoring COVID speech on Twitter. And you know, they, for example, put out a video in in the, the heat of COVID in 2021, where they instructed young children to report their own family members for for disinformation uh, by by citing C, if if their family members simply cited CDC data that that uh, that compared the death rate of COVID to the death rate of the flu. They gave an example uh, of of someone tweeting. Uh, COVID is no more fatal than the flu. And they go through an instruction manual, basically, for a young child to report her own uncle for for posting that. Not because it's wrong, because he, he cited CDC data, but because it would undermine the fear response. Mm. Talk to people a little bit about the uh, the blob and how you came to understand it and who is in the blob. Uh, and, I, and I just want to also, I, I'm interested in that because... It, I was sort of looking at the history of propaganda and these um, these tactics of of getting mind control, really the persuasion, mind control, hypnosis, whatever you want to call it. And in the 20th century, we had these sort of dictatorial leaders that used it, and they had their own administration. But now we have these incredibly bloated bureaucracy or blobs, and I think the blob model applies beyond the security state, but, but talk to talk about how you've come to understand that and your people that may not have seen your last appearance and who they are and what they're doing. Sure. And I, I totally agree with your assessment, but the blob is actually a term from president Obama's deputy national security advisor, Ben Rhodes, who was opining on the difficulty within the white house of getting things done because they seem to be up against an impenetrable force, a, uh, an amorphous, alien monster uh, that was more powerful than even even the Obama White House. And so he sort of coined this phrase out of desperation in a certain or exasperation in a certain sense, but it's been adopted in Washington. Uh, it re- and it refers to the foreign policy establishment. And I'll sketch out what that is. And it's not just the foreign policy establishment within the government. It is the external stakeholders in the corporate and financial worlds who don't, who are the donor drafter class off of the the government activities? So I'll sketch that out a little bit here. So, so the foreign policy establishment is the side of our government that faces outward rather than inward to manage the American empire rather than the American homeland. So you know gov- we have government agencies that manage the American homeland, like housing and urban development. Uh, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Labor. You know, these are all, they all face inward. They don't do international business, so to speak, with, you know, Ukraine or Moldova or Sub-Saharan Africa. We have three sides of our government, three basically departments or, or constellations of, of, uh, of entities that, that face outward. And those are the Pentagon, the State Department, and our intelligence services, such as the CIA. 
Now, together, they basically form this defense diplomacy intelligence apparatus. And because they face outward and their their mandate is to is to protect and maximize U.S. national interests on the world stage, they have a license to do dirty tricks that that domestic facing institutions are not empowered to do. So, for example, they can wiretap foreign citizens. They don't need to get a warrant for it. They can bribe foreign media institutions to promote or kill stories. They can set up their own media vehicles to be able to swing hearts and minds so that another country's own parliament votes votes for or against a, a different bill there in order to get the people of a foreign country to support a U.S. military base in the region or a U.N. Security Council vote in a region. And they're they're deployed with this dirty tricks power which involves a license to lie. So for example, the Central Intelligence Agency under National Security Council 10-2 back in the 1940s was given basically a, a license to do all sorts of criminal or illegal activity as long as they maintain plausible deniability. Meaning as long as the US government could plausibly deny that that the Central Intelligence Agency or that the U.S. government was behind it, they could engage in criminal activity. Now, that was all set up. The foreign policy establishment, the blob, who again on the inside is State Department, Pentagon, and, and CIA, we'll, we'll just say for shorthand for the intelligence community. The, the social contract, when that was set up in 1947, 1948, was that it was for managing the American empire for the benefit of the citizens of the homeland. And it would have these dirty tricks powers. It would be able to spy. It would be able to lie. It would be able to rig elections, be able to rig media, because at the end of the day, the citizens here would benefit from it. But it would never be turned on our own citizens. That's what our constitution is for and, and all the other you know protections that go into being a U.S. citizen. Now, the issue is, is so that, that's the inside of the blob. The outside of it is the corporate and financial stakeholder class. These are the corporations and the banks and the and the financial investors who are the sort of donor drafter class uh, off of the activities of the government. So you can think of when I refer to drafting, you can think of it like a bike race. The strategy in a bike race is not to be out in front where where the full blast of the wind is hitting you. The most efficient strategy in a bike race is to is to be second in line, to draft off of the person who goes first so that they cut the wind for you so that you are more you save all your energy and are able to just overtake them on the last lap so to speak. So US multinational corporations since the age of globalization have relied on the blob, have relied on the State Department, the Pentagon and the CIA in order to protect and secure foreign markets for their products, to protect and secure cheap manufacturing in those regions, to protect and secure against issues around tariffs or taxes or labor or regulations. And it's the job of the State Department to go in and pressure that, that foreign country's government. It's the job of our Central Intelligence Agency to go in and rig those elections or to go in and set up a constellation of surround sound NGO media in order to get that country's population to support that initiative. And it's the job of the Pentagon to do both the sort of dangling threat of military intervention in the name of democracy or the civil affairs hearts and minds works around psychological warfare in order to make that that happen. Now that is that that redounds to the benefit of US multinational corporations who operate in that region. So a famous example in the oil and gas space for example is you know Exxon Exxon Mobil, Chevron, these companies most of their most of their profits come from all the different shale or hydrocarbon reserves around the whole rest of the world. Other countries don't want to voluntarily just give up their oil or give up their gas or give up these these loose business partnerships where they get, you know, mostly, you know, railed in negotiations there. The government has to cut the wind for for Chevron and for ExxonMobil. The government has to go in and basically coerce these foreign governments or or offer carrots and sticks. And so so those companies draft off of the activities of the blob. Now, because they are also major financial donors to the political class, they are essentially donors into the decision making within the government, while their own corporate and financial interests draft off the activities of the government who does that work. So, you know, Pfizer in, in, the, in the biosecurity space is a great example of this. Without having government pressure for these mandates, government pressure for the for you know vaccine mandates and things like this. 
Pfizer itself would not be able to have the profit margin. The government cuts the wind by capturing the market for them. And, you know, and even, you know, companies like Moderna, who was, you know, one of the other major ones, that was, Moderna was a Pentagon contractor from the day it was born. You know, this is a, this, it's very much keeping the money in house. And, and I, I got a bunch of questions off of that. Uh, would it, but, but like, since you mentioned Pfizer, have you, have you been watching the uh, house hearings about uh, vaccines? I thought some really interesting stuff started happening where they're, they're starting to uncover uh, how how uh, sideways the FDA was in terms of firing their virologist and having the hematologist oncologist call all the shots. Uh, a lot of the questioning was directed. I, I watched some questioning of our friend Joe Latipo, who's a Surgeon General for Florida, and they were saying, "Are you are you a virologist? Are you an infectious disease expert?" And the head of the committee said, "Neither was anyone in the FDA committee." So what you, what what is the issue we make here? But my my question really is. Is is the Overton window opening? Is do you think that people are going to be able to fight back on the blob? Is is there something afoot? Yes, I mean, I think the past eighteen months have been a string of successes, almost one after another, except for now the increased role of just you know government interventions in countries like Brazil, countries like Pakistan, and even here in this country, as uh, we now have a number of government censorship sort of. Uh, and I can get into this. I mean, some of this gets to do with the EU Digital Services Act and how the State Department is basically trying to get well, Europe to pass censorship laws to boomerang on us here, or the state level censorship laws around media literacy. I, that I, are I do. Into play. I, I, I do want to get into that and Brazil and whatnot. But in the after the break, though, I want to kind of set things up first. A um, couple other quick questions. Uh, is it correct? Would it be correct to say that they came up with the term malinformation instead of misinformation so they can start to turn their powers inward? They're, they're ev- they, th- this helps them take what should be going outward and now directing it inward because if I'm a creator of malinformation, I'm essentially a terrorist or something? Yeah, well, the malinformation backstory is quite funny because they'd already turned the apparatus inward after the 2016 election. See, see, initially it was a Russian disinformation. It, so it started out with this mm. disinformation word, which of course is a military term. Before 20, mm. the year 2016, we never referred to our own citizens, even accused lies as being disinformation. That's a, that is a, a literal military word that was just ported home and then normalized. But you know, they started to have a big problem. This is after the 2016 election when Brexit had happened in, in Europe and all the European right-wing populist parties were rising in power and Trump was taking office here. And so they wanted to stop the rise of right-wing populism on the internet because that was its entire media support structure and therefore its political support structure. So, you know, they, they had this, this Russian disinformation concept, but the definition of disinformation was it's, it's not just false, you know, it's false in advance. And so you are basically perpetrating a fraud. But then they had a big problem there. This is this is before the the noose was fully tied around big tech's neck by the U.S. government. They were still trying to use fact checkers and and basically mm-hmm. you know emails to say this is before they were just just coercing them you, you know uh, with threats of crisis PR and advertiser boycotts and and government regulation that which which was the real sort of crackdown. But this is in 2017 2018. They were they were negotiating with the tech platforms because this is a brand new role for the U.S. government to instruct on censorship, and the the platforms were relatively willing to play ball when there was a, a documentable digital forensics evidence of a Russian you know hostile information campaign, and it was genuinely disinformation. But then they said, well, here's the problem is um, we can't really prove intent in a lot of these cases, so misinformation is just as bad as disinformation. And the platforms were sort of on board with that in the beginning. There was so there was pushback, but they said, "All right, well, you know, you're allowed to be wrong, but you know, if it's a really sensitive issue, if there's something where we just can't tell the difference, okay, we'll smudge misinformation into that." Because at the end of the smudge. day, well, because at the end of the day, they another, just another military this term. Industry. Right, right. Well, they had just rolled <laughs> out this. They, 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 the government at this time was capacity building through tens of millions of dollars this brand new field of fact checkers. And if the fact checkers could provide some sort of of patina to hang out, some sort of fig leaf to say, well, this is factually wrong, then both mis and disinformation were covered. The problem was is by twenty nine early twenty nineteen, they most of the things that that were most deadly to them politically could not even be fact checked. They couldn't be fact. They couldn't be documentably 
you know, um, it, there, there was no factual way to prove that a potential claim was false. So, for example, around the Hunter Biden laptop, you couldn't necessarily put Russian fingerprints on it. You couldn't necessarily say that the thing was wrong. Or about mail-in ballots. Mail-in ballots have been argued for 250 years to be an unsafe way to, to carry out an election. Even the even the Abraham uh, Lincoln election in 1862, you know, made arguments against the uh, the use of mail-in ballots because they're not safe. They couldn't factually prove that the use of mail-in ballots were not safe. They couldn't fact check that. But the use of the word malinformation allowed them to to have platforms remove information even when there was no sort of fact checker email to be able to to validate the government's position on it. So it was a way to basically end run the idea of of truth itself it, it and and the the, the watch phrase mm -hmm. for malinformation is undermine public faith and confidence that's what malinformation mm -hmm. is it says when, when something is true or we can't or we can't prove it's false but it still leads the general population to undermine public faith and confidence in a critical government initiative or you know a, a, a pillar of of u.s critical infrastructure like our public health response well, it's still leading them to believe that true statement. So citing CDC data, for example, in the in the DHS censorship instructional video, citing CDC mm -hmm. data was deemed malinformation because even though it's true, it's, it's, it's CDC data, it still leads people to undermine public faith and confidence in the severity of the government's COVID response. Mm. Well, I, I need a break here. Um, Every time I talk to you, my my mind starts to swim. Uh, I I want to come you, back around. Can I leave you with one quick? Go ahead. One sorry, just yeah. one last thing is this is very funny. On DHS's own website, before they purged it, although all this stuff is archived on my Twitter account, DHS's own website had an infographic for mis and malinformation, and and the infographic for malinformation was a mega was a was a, a bullhorn shooting out missiles, and the missiles had the word facts on them. So, so they were arguing that shooting out factual information from your mouth, facts, were you know were, were what had to be destroyed. Oh my God! That they were the they were as dangerous as armed missiles. I mean, think about that. You can't handle the truth. This is I always reminded people even during the pandemic. I said, you know, that Jack Nicholson character in A Few Good Men was the villain. He was the absolute villain when he screamed, "You can't handle the truth." It was it was not the guy advocating right. for something reasonable on behalf of the government. So uh, I, when we get back, I want to talk about the Brazil and Europe and, like you said, they're, how they're running around the world and having their way that way. Uh, I want to I want you to tell us about who the Atlantic Group is and what they. You mentioned them briefly, uh, and then and the Department of Justice. I, I think you you occasionally blow past them as a participant in all this. I'm, I'm curious how they fit into this scheme of the state, the Pentagon, and the CIA. It seems like they're, is it very simple or is it complicated or is it depend on the administration? I'll make it as simple as possible, but uh, there's a very definite answer to that. So I look forward to expounding right. on it after all the right. break. We'll do all that after the break. Uh, Mike Benz, as he said, follow him on Twitter, Mike Benz Cyber. That's his X account, Mike Benz, B-E-N-Z, Cyber. Also a foundation for Freedom Online. Uh, if you're not following Mike Benz on uh, X, you're, you're making a huge mistake. You're, you're really going to, you're going to miss what's actually happening as as. Scott Adams says about you every almost every day because if you don't watch my friends, you, there's no way to understand what what is up here. Because uh, otherwise, you walk around and go, "What is? How is this? What? How could they get this so wrong? What is going on?" It starts to organize around uh, what Mike Benz teaches us. Take a little break. Be right back after this. Let's talk about aging because everyone wants to know how to slow it down. For almost a decade, I've been taking a healthy aging supplement called True Niagen. This supplement boosts NAD. That's something that cells can't live without. It's done with a patented form of nicotinamide riboside called NR, or Niagen. It's more efficient and more scientifically reviewed than NMN or other NAD boosters. True Niagen is truly the best way to boost NAD levels. And it's made by Chromadex. They're the gold standard in the NAD space. Dr. Charles Brenner, the scientist who discovered the NAD boosting potential of NR, explains. And the center of the metabolism that allows the conversion of food into energy is NAD coenzymes. And NAD gets disturbed um, in the aging process. And as we're exposed to conditions of metabolic stress, mm. niagen, which is the um, 
form of, of NR that was developed by Chromadex is the, is the best and the only fully legal form of NR. And this is really the gold standard for NAD boosting uh, vitamins. I love this product. I urge you to try it. Go to drdrew.com slash trueniagen for 20% off your order. That is drdrew.com slash trueniagen, T-R-U-N-I-A-G-E-N, and enter Dr. Drew at checkout, D-R-D-R-E-W, enter it at checkout for 20% off. You can spend thousands of dollars and dozens of hours trying to look a few years younger, or you can skip all that and the hassle and go with what works, GenuCell Skin Care. GenuCell is the secret to better skin. Their products are made in the USA using a proprietary technology that combines a naturally effective base with non-GMO ingredients. In fact, you might have witnessed the astonishing effects of GenuCell during a recent unplanned moment of our show. When just a little GenuCell XV restored my skin within minutes right before your eyes. That is how fast these products work. I know I'm a snob about the products I use on my face. Everybody knows it. Every time I go to the dermatologist's office, they're just rows and rows of different creams. Retinols, vitamin C cream, under eye cream, night creams. Scrubs. And then when I get to the counter, they're overpriced. All kinds of products that you can all find at GenuCell.com. Susan and I love GenuCell so much, we've created our own bundle so you can try our favorite anti-wrinkle creams, correcting serums, under eye treatments, Say goodbye to those fine lines, forehead wrinkles, skin redness, even those dark under eye bags. Women and men of all skin types, Genucel has got you covered. Order right now at genucel.com slash Drew to save 50%, actually over 50%, and you'll get a free luxury spa box plus free shipping. That is genucel.com slash Drew, G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash D-R-E-W. As you see today, we've got kind of an unusual situation where we had a complete uh, internet outage at our home, where our studio is. And uh, so Susan had the brilliant idea of having me run down to my medical office, which is this is where I am now. We have a very strong uh, Wi-Fi. And uh, before Anthony comes in, maybe I'll even give you a little tour. It'll be kind of fun. Just a very little, not much. I can't really move this computer around very much, but at least this room. Uh, today, we're talking to Mike Benz. We are going to talk to Anthony Brown after Mike. Uh, Mike was teaching us about the blob and its uh, function and intent. And uh, before the break, we were talking about the DOJ and its role in this and the Atlantic Group. So, uh, Mike, let's get back into this. Yeah. Well, the Atlantic Council is a really fascinating case study in in how the blob works both inside and out. So nominally, the Atlantic Council is said to be NATO's think tank. Now, NATO is the pan-Western world's military alliance, and it's supposed to just be military. So not civilian, not not political. It's just, you know, in a in a Western democracy, the military answers to the civilian class. But there's a big problem, which was discovered basically midway through the 20th century, which, which is after we switched to, in 1948, to an international set of laws that you could no longer acquire territory by military force. This is in the UN Declaration on Human Rights. And everything switched to a hearts and minds game uh, to, for the governments of democracies. Uh, the it you know our our intelligence state essentially figured out quickly that the easiest way to win a war is not to fight another country's army army to army that's quite expensive many people die every missile that we launch you know costs millions of dollars the easiest way to win a war is to simply uh, overthrow the country's government from the inside have a new government elected a new political leader a new president. And that president has essentially civilian control over the military and can get the military to stand down or surrender. And so this made NATO into a political animal. It made whoever gets elected in any NATO country an essential part of the military calculus. Now, by our own military doctrine, we say that there's four, there's four theaters of war. There is the strategic, the high-level strategy for the war. There is the tactical you know, the individual tactics of a particular battle or strike. There's the logistical. This has to do with supply lines and, and the equipment used. And there's the political. So there's four ways to win or lose a war. And on the political, for example, uh, you know, we, we commonly say in, in our own sort of, uh, you know, U.S. Army War College paper documents, we lost Vietnam, for example, not because of the strategic, the tactical, the logistical. We lost because of the political. We lost because our own Congress cut off the funds. 
Our own president ended it. It was not like we were, you know, hosed on the military battlefield. It was that at some point, the American people got sick of it politically. The hearts and minds switched. And so they shut off the spigot to even wage the war. You can't have the logistics without the money to pay for it. We're seeing this right now, for example, in Ukraine. This is why the military is so involved in the media push to get the you know a more appropriations funding for the Ukraine war. Uh, it's not so, but but get, getting back to to the Atlantic Council here. So the Atlantic Council represents the political arm and essentially the clandestine political operations arm of NATO. When NATO, when there's a government issue within a NATO country that might affect a NATO priority, the Atlantic Council's principal goal is to use a whole of society apparatus that 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 gathers together at consensus meetings and puts a bunch of people on payroll to essentially get NATO priorities uh, installed at the government level and at the so sociocultural level within NATO countries so that there's no friction to what NATO wants done. Now, the Atlantic Council has seven CIA directors on its board, se seven number one former heads of the CIA on its board of directors. Now, you know, as I, I frequently say, a lot of people don't even know that seven former heads of the CIA are still alive, let alone all clustered and centered on the board of a of a single entity that is essentially the top dog in the censorship space. Now they now they're funding, they get annual funding from the Pentagon and not just the Pentagon, they get annual discrete funding from all four branches of the US military, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, and the Army. They also get annual funding from the State Department, and they also get annual funding from CIA cutouts like the National Endowment for Democracy. We even our own Washington Post acknowledges a CIA cutout. They are they essentially represent the the uh, the barometer, the political barometer of the U.S. intelligence community as well as across Europe, and they are that consensus building arm. Now, what's so troubling about all of this is that the Atlantic Council has such a major role and really was at the forefront of the construction of the censorship industry. This was you know, after the after the Crimea annexation in 2014 when it was perceived that half of Ukraine had fallen to Russia and there need to be a military reconquest of eastern Ukraine and of Crimea. The Atlantic Council went around twisting the arm of all the different European countries to pass sanctions on Russia which harmed them, themselves economically so they needed to be pressured. Much of that pressure came from the Atlantic Council and its corporate and, and financial and government stakeholders, because in addition to getting funding from the from the U.S. government and U.S. intelligence state and the British government, and the British intelligence state, they're also funded by all of the major oil companies, all of the major energy companies, all of the major military contractors like Boeing and Raytheon. They basically represent the, the donor and drafter class of the U.S. government's blob. And so the, the Atlantic Council began to fixate on the necessity of internet censorship when after, after the State Department poured $5 billion into, the, into Ukrainian civil society for the 2014 Ukraine coup, and it still was not enough to swing the hearts and minds of the people in eastern Ukraine. So they said, well, propaganda is not enough. Peer-to-peer -peer communications between people in Central and Eastern Europe is actually the real enemy here. We need a censorship capacity. And they basically plotted to set up, they were one of the main driving forces behind the construction of a domestic government censorship office in this country, DHS, which I mentioned you know, uh, in, in our previous segment. And the Atlantic Council is, not only are they this kind of CIA hub, and not only are they this, this kind of you know, representation arm for the corporate and financial class, they were the contracted disinformation flaggers for the U.S. government. So not only do they plan to get DHS uh, setting up a, a censorship agency in 2018, they were formally tapped, formally partnered by the Department of Homeland Security to censor the 2020 election. Them, along with Graphica, who is a Pentagon a contractor who came out of the Pentagon Psychological Warfare Research Center, as well as the Stanford Air and Observatory and, and the University of Washington. Those four entities comprised both the Election Integrity Partnership that was the censorship attack dog for the 2020 election. But then as soon as the 2020 election ended, they closed down shop and set up a new censorship agency called the, or consortium called the Virality Project. And they were responsible in large part for so much of the censorship of COVID-19. In fact, their, their yeah. partners, Graphica, Graphica, as I mentioned, were the PSYOP center of the Pentagon as a for-profit firm. 
Graphica was the very first entity to descend on the U.S. social media landscape to censor COVID origins conspiracy theories in December 2019. In their own documents, they said they started their censorship work on December 16th, 2019. Now, that's just four days after the outbreak of pneumonia-like symptoms. And again, their job was working for the Pentagon doing psychological operations work. So just for now, when, when I published a news story about that, they responded publicly and said, well, actually, that's there's a 30-day back date. We didn't start our censorship work until January 2020. It was January 16th, not December 20th. Well, that's still one month after the outbreak. And that's still two months before it would even be called COVID-19. What were they doing in January 2020 with millions of dollars from the Pentagon and doing work for years for the Central Intelligence Agency, drawing these sophisticated network maps of every major influential news outlet in the U.S., in the U.K., in Italy, in Spain, in France, in Greece, from the entire NATO nexus uh, on, on, on social media was network wrapped with meticulous precision by the Pentagon's Psychological Operations Unit in a joint partnership with NATO's STRATCOM Center of Excellence, which is the Psychological Warfare Center of NATO, which was set up after 2014. That same military PSYOPs warfare fighting apparatus between both the Pentagon and NATO had a, had a joint pursuit to censor anybody as soon as the, the outbreak of the virus who questioned whether it might be a lab leak. Now, I would say if I was the Pentagon there, I would sure love a Pentagon-funded uh, social media censorship firm to do that work for me if I happen to be the one behind it. It's almost like the perfect crime. And it, it there's a lot with what you just said, obviously. Uh, it It seems like... If you had, if I pick two people that would be uh, completely intolerable to what what you describe as the intent of these organizations like this, two people that would have to be stopped would be Elon Musk and Donald Trump. Th those two are uh, an overtly anathema for different reasons. I would say, I mean, one, they must be fearful of Trump just running around and running amok and figuring things out on his own without their input. Elon Musk, because he can't be uh, cast asunder by them, at least his organization can't, although they have found ways to go uh, through Brazil and Europe and other places to try to uh, pressure him that way, I suppose. Is that what's happening? That's exactly right. You know, with the Elon Musk situation, I've long said that if he, if he had become the world's richest man by uh, running a lemonade stand, I think he would have been crushed like a bug. But the fact is, is Elon Musk's other properties, SpaceX and Tesla, are critical to the U.S. government's own blob operations. So SpaceX has something like one to two thirds of the entire world's low Earth satellites. All of the government, the U.S. government's telecommunications work runs through runs through SpaceX. If, mm -hmm. if you were to simply, you know, so th there's a huge dependency on Elon Musk by our Pentagon, by our CIA, by our State Department. Same thing with Tesla. Tesla basically represents the Western world's, you know, promise of, of renewable batteries for renewable energy. You know, there was, this, there was uh, actually a lot of uh, quite a scandal several years ago when the U.S. government overthrew the government of Bolivia in what was called at the time the lithium coup. And a lot of yeah. folks were were taking to Twitter to sort of castigate Elon Musk for, you know, uh, for for being the beneficiary of the U.S. government, uh, essentially doing that same drafting operation where it's not Tesla who is you know paying to overthrow that government; it's the Pentagon and the State Department and the CIA doing it. But but Tesla essentially drafting off of that activity, you know, and maximizing profit because now they can they have access to the lithium. Now, I'm not opining on the, the morality of that. This, this is simply the way international business is done through the blob. But what I'm saying is, is the, the, the national security state is sort of between a rock and a hard place with Musk in certain respects, because the natural tool they would want to use in a situation like this is something called CFIUS, which is, which is a nationalization law that says if something is a national security threat, we can basically just nationalize the company. Now, that mm -hmm. is that is a very heavy-handed tool to use and you can do that to a small company. You say it's got Russian ties and we just nationalize it. But if you do that to the richest man in the world, 
who is, you know, who is widely beloved, you know, by, by not just m- m- much of our own country, but must have, m- much of the entire world. I mean, much, even what he's doing with uh, the interplanetary hope, you know, he's, he's far eclipsed NASA in terms of what SpaceX has done with, with modern rocket technology. To just break the back of someone like that and strip him of his assets would cause a flight from capital from the United States into countries like China and, and into other great power competitors of the U.S. And so what they're doing now is a death by a thousand paper cuts. You know, the, this, this, the state of Delaware, remember, just two months ago, deprived Elon Musk of $56 billion in a single mm-hmm. pen stroke, breaking two centuries worth of Delaware corporate law. I was a corporate lawyer. We were told Delaware, the thing that makes Delaware, Delaware, the reason that two thirds of the, of the country's corporations make their headquarters in Delaware, despite operating everywhere else, is because the Delaware courts always respect the meeting of the minds in a in a hands, you know, in a hands off arm's length negotiation between the shareholders and the and the and the corporate directors and officers. They broke that precedent in a completely unprecedented way just to strip Elon Musk of $50 billion more dollars that he could have deployed towards X and towards his own enterprises. They did the same thing to, uh, to Tesla and to SpaceX. The state of California has gone after Tesla. The Justice Department has gone after SpaceX simply for not hiring enough illegal immigrants. This is something that's also sure. completely unprecedented. They argued that, that, uh, that a U.S national champion was breaking the law by not hiring enough people who were not U.S. citizens and who were here illegally. Instead of prosecuting the illegal immigrants, they prosecuted a country for a a, a prime business of the United States for not for 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 not prior for prioritizing U.S. citizens. It's it's completely insane. But the FEC has gone after it. The, 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 the SEC has gone after them. The FTC has gone after them. The Justice Department has gone after them. The Department of Labor has gone after them. They are trying to do a death by a thousand paper cuts to try to get him to be reasonable on these issues. And, you know, the, the ultimate weapon in their toolkit right now is the NATO censorship law coming from Europe through the, uh, through the, uh, the EU Digital Services Act, as well as these new state censorship laws coming out of recently U.S. State Department regime change countries like Brazil and like Pakistan. Is, is there something, I, I have to kind of move towards uh, wrapping this up. There's a lot more to talk about. We didn't, we didn't answer the question of the DOJ's role in all this. Maybe you can just throw that in. But what does the average person do? What should we be doing about all this? Well, the number one thing is talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, because every layer of our strategic options rely on having an elevated national consciousness and of the perception of being a hero for responding to the people's popular will. You know, Congress was, you know, m- many members of Congress were apprised of how of, of the censorship situation before the Twitter files. It was not until it was on the tip of everyone's tongue that you started to have three different censorship hearings in the Weaponization Subcommittee and, and armada of subpoenas and people hauled in for transcribed interviews. Two hearings at the, the House Homeland Security Committee, a censorship hearing in, in oversight. When it was on the tip of everyone's tongues, that's when members of Congress want to be heroes because they feel they'll be rewarded by by being valorized for for what they do. The media will want to cover it more when everybody's already talking about it because it's a hot topic and they know it will go more viral because you're already talking about it. It's already trending. There's already a level of consciousness about the backstory and who the, the cast of heroes and villains in the story are. And the more that happens, the more donors in the free speech space will want to donate to civil society institutions who are taking the issue on you know, for the same reason. So this is basically a whole of society network defense is what I'm laying out here that, that ties together our allies in Congress, our allies at the state government level through the state AGs and the state treasuries and the state governorships, the private sector companies like Elon Musk at X and like, like Rumble and like I think a growing camp of, of free speech alternative private sector institutions, as in the civil society space and as in the media space, all starting to work together. We, we've seen that work very well over the past 18 months, but you know the, the response to that from the blob side has been to raise the stakes and to, and to effectively try to try to you know outlaw or criminalize speech through through these tactics involving you know with the EU Digital Services Act and and the actions in Brazil and Pakistan. Yeah, it's it's uh, I see that happening, but it seems like it is slowly moving, right? Slowly going that way, in in, a, in the way you're describing. Um, gosh, I had one last question about the blob. Oh, 
is there a world where the blob and its behavior is rational and that we just don't know all the facts, so to speak, that we're that whatever they're doing has some some value to the average citizen that I just can't see. The tactics they're using to protect it does not look like it's you know a, a just cause. But is there a world where what they're doing is literally uh, uh, better for us? Certainly. So, you know, the way they would describe it and the way they did describe it in 2017, 2018, 2019, when all this was being set up, was that if free speech was allowed to persist on the internet, the entire rules-based international order would collapse and potentially the international finance system along with it. So at the time, you know, the reason that the Atlantic Council and these NATO folks were sort of, you know, able to get the kind of total buy-in across their whole of society network around this was if you if if Brexit gives rise to Frexit and Spexit and Italy exit in in the UK and the US goes nationalist populist and Brazil goes nationalist populist and Hungary and Pakistan and all these countries go nationalist populist well first of all if that once that happens in Europe if Marine Le Pen wins that election and the AFD wins that election and and the Vox party in Spain wins that election well there goes the EU the EU is the commercial arm of NATO so basically NATO is going to come undone if the EU comes undone if NATO comes undone, well, then now you have hundreds of billions of dollars in the in the international finance system that are that need to be repaid through the pressure of the IMF and the World Bank. Well, who's going to enforce the edicts of the IMF and the World Bank if you don't have NATO to enforce it when a country goes into default? Who is going to you know who, who's going to hold a country's debts to account? So you, you'll basically you know from from their perspective, it was like the entire rules based international order on the democratic institution side, on the financial side, on the on the corporate infrastructure side. It would almost be like the ending scene of Fight Club where they plant the bombs at the bottom of the building of the credit card companies to reset everything to zero. So they were making the argument that the only reason these political threats were, were emergent and ascendant was because of free speech on the internet. We need to kill free speech on the internet to save the rules-based international order. And in a certain sense, they are not entirely wrong. Now, that doesn't mean they're right. And like I said, um, you know, I think that they were doomsday sayers about it. But, you know, they basically pulled this, you know, tried to pull this off without without being so explicit in their in their public messaging. You know, in their public messaging, oh, it was the misdis and malinformation is a threat to democracy. Not that, you know, right. actually free speech will end the world as we know it. Once they start talking right. like that, they lose their political. Then people start talking about defunding NATO and then they don't right, even operate. Right. So. So interesting. But but you're you're kind you're semi optimistic. Is that is that would that be accurate? I am I am hugely optimistic about the power of our current playbook to be able to win in the fight where where we were having it from 2016 to 2020. The issue is and and we know this to be the case because you can listen to the squeals of the censorship industry's own insiders, you know, a month ago the New York Times had an A1 Sunday edition front page lead story about how how they were losing the the war to to censor disinformation because of this exact blueprint strategy. The problem is is as we're winning downstream, they've moved the battle upstream to a play to end the first amendment as we know it. That's what the Supreme Court case that's being decided is is, you know, is has in its balance. The government is arguing the first amendment did not anticipate social media. The first amendment is outdated. We need to expand it so that it's effectively neutralized so that the government can quarterback the private sector and civil society and media for censorship operations. The state department and the CIA have moved to coerce Europe to pass these censorship laws, which will basically bankrupt any U.S. company, any U.S. social media platform who does not censor what NATO says to censor. And because you can't be a, a multinational social media tech platform unless you operate in Europe. Europe has more people than the United States. It's 550 million people in the, in the EU. If you don't, and now that's now the State Department was behind this, this censorship push. And they're the ones who are, who are pushing it. You know, the, and the same thing in Brazil, you know, as, as you guys will, will see next week when, when my foundation publishes this report, the, the Brazilian censorship state is a creation of the U.S. blob. They, they funneled millions of dollars into Brazil, into their legal structures, into their civil society to create this bribery structure to get them to pass the censorship laws that they have for the past five years. And the Atlanta Council was at the heart of that as well. In June 2019, the Atlanta Council held you know, an entire panel 
uh, you know, conference on how to get Brazil to install a system of censorship that escalated radically under the Biden administration through a web of CIA cutouts like the National Endowment for Democracy and dozens of U.S. State Department funded NGOs. And it's a proxy attack on X. Let's leave it there. And uh, where do you want people to go to read that and, and continue to follow you? Number one place is going to be on X at Mike Ben Cyber. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a rabid poster there. Uh, and then my foundation's website is foundationforfreedomonline.com. When is that paper coming out? Monday morning. All right, sir. Uh, good luck with that. And we'll, uh, see, we'll uh, talk to you subsequent to that firestorm, I hope. Great. Thanks. You Appreciate then. your time. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate you being here. That is Mike Benz. Follow him on Mike Ben Cyber on uh, X. So we're going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, I have to wrap up pretty soon here. We've got my friend Anthony Brown ready to go. Uh, Anthony has an interesting story, and he's both in terms of his own life and what he's engaged in right now. Uh, welcome, Anthony Brown, please. Can we get him in there? I'm bringing him there in. There you are. Hey, man. Hey, how you doing? Hey, good. How are you? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so is that is that Brown Manor over your right shoulder? Yes, that's that's the place. Okay. Tell, tell, I want you to tell tell everybody your own story. Sketch it. I think we've we've gone over it before, but just sketch your own story briefly, and then what you're doing now and why you're so committed to this. Okay. Well, my own story is a bunch of childhood abuse to the extreme um, that led to me leaving home at 14. Got involved with doing drugs almost every day of my life until I turned 37. And then the next thing you know, um, somebody intervened and asked me if I wanted some help. Then I went to school for a long period of time, got a whole bunch of degrees, and I want to go out and save the world. The book is Park Bench to Park Avenue. Uh, that, that's a very abbreviated version of a fantastic story. <laughs> Anthony, I mean, Anthony you know, was, I uh, could always talk about was, the beating. That, you know, it's no, but it's, I mean, let's just say it this way you were deep into drugs, you were selling drugs, you were living uh, in that world uh, and had trouble. Uh, how many times were you arrested and put in prison? Oh my god, <laughs> I, I, yeah, right. I spent, <laughs> um, out of the 90s, I think I spent probably two and a half years out of jail. Out of the whole nineties, right. yeah, and and tell yeah. him that quick story that he was he used to sell drugs in this one corner, and uh, you got arrested after, <laughs> <laughs> and you were sitting in prison thinking, "What's wrong? Something is wrong." Right, right. There's got to be an issue because I thought I thought that you know at first I thought I wasn't like being sneaky enough, you know, and it's it's really funny because. This all happened in Orange County way back in, in the 90s. And when I came to Orange County in the 90s, there was only like four black people and I was one, you know. And my disguise was I had a D.A.R.E. t-shirt and I'm out at two o'clock in the morning, all cracked out trying to sell drugs. And, you know, I got arrested, went to, went to the county jail and thought, well, there's a problem. So I thought maybe I'll hide it in my sock and I went back to the same place and got busted and, you know, Kind of got a little smarter and thought, well, maybe I'll keep it in my hand. But then I got too high and I forgot it was in my hand and I got busted. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, I went back. Then I got super smart. And I go, OK, well, I got the solution. So I just went one block south and still got busted. You know, um, it's, it's why, that's that's why I love thinking. drug addiction. It's why I love what it does to people's thinking. It's so it's so funny how we think of that disease. But and you became a nurse and then a nurse manager and a nurse uh, director of nursing and have uh, and now a do you have a nurse practitioner's license or what do you, what do you, do you have a um the board of the like board that? of registered nursing in california has me listed as a nurse practitioner i still have to take the state board exams but yeah right. it's um pretty soon i'll be legally allowed to pass out medication great and you grew up in ohio before you uh joined the carnivals and the drugs and the tilt whirls and uh, lived under the turtle world, which I said just glibly, and you go, "Yeah, how'd you know?" <laughs> uh, and uh, and and you committed to building a, a place to help others. Uh, you understand this disease intimately. You worked in a psychiatric hospital setting, and tell me about Brown, Brown Manor. A uh, Brown Manor, I, I, you know, as you said, I, I'm originally I'm from Ohio. I went to California, spent 44 years, and then decided in December to come back and give to the community. And so I purchased this 9,000 square foot abandoned mansion and I'm going to, and, and I wrote, I wrote a transitional care program for homeless people. 
and I'm going to implement it there. And since I've had 23 years of being homeless and about 20 years of education, I feel that I'm, I know what I'm doing. You know, yeah. I was just yeah. sitting here laughing. I, I have a PhD in vacancy, you know, and so I know, <laughs> you know, what time but, it but is. You know, and, but you know the, right, you know the illness, you know what keeps people on the streets and you know what gets people off the streets, right? And, uh, and you're, you're the perfect person. And, and by the way, you know, the thing we always tell the patients is, you know, hang around the winners. You're, you're the winner. You're one of the winners. You, you are the example of what they could be. And so I, I just think it's, um, I think what you're doing is great. I, I want to support it. Uh, tell people what they can do if they want to be a part of it or, you know, when this is going to happen or if they want to refer patients to you guys, how, how's that all going to work? Well, right now we're still in the construction phase. They can always go to my website. Um, we just got done doing a, um, a video tour where you can actually walk through Brown Manor. Um, we have um, one of our fundraising things is you can actually tag a spot. And if you want to adopt a room, we'll put your name on a plate. You know, this way you're getting more involved because this is a community thing. And that's what's really important because we're missing that aspect. A lot of people think, well, how come somebody can't get well by themselves? Well. It takes, oh, it takes a no, no, no. to raise a person. Yeah, you know? no, no, yeah. Yeah. They, 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 their brain isn't working right. They, their brain right, isn't working right. right. They need structure. Okay. They need to rebuild. Yeah, and it has to be long-term. This this isn't a 30- mm. or 60- or 90-day program. I'm, I, I'm creating it for a whole year, you know? Yeah. And so you get yeah. to live in a year in, in Brown Manor, which is a mansion. So, you know, and, and I think... That's going to help develop your self-esteem, your self-worth, and then change oh. your self-concept. And that's that's what we're all about. Self-efficacy. AnthonyHowardBrown.com is the website. Go there. And uh, is is that where people can contribute if they want to be a part of the solution? Yeah, we have a. Um, once you go to that web page and everything's there, the um, virtual tour, the um, if you want to donate there the um go fund me everything is is right there or you know buy a bunch of books and you know things like that Every, everything i do dr drew is for this absolutely yeah. everything you know I, I i've been fortunate enough to turn my life around and get a good life and and i'm okay you know i don't i don't need a whole bunch but now it's time to give because that's what's more important than anything is that to give to our brothers and sisters on the streets because a lot of people don't realize people out there is somebody's brother, mother, grandmother, sister. They're related to somebody. And it's really fascinating because a lot of people don't realize that they might be one accident or one disease away from being homeless. And yeah. so we right. really need to get involved. We really need to show some compassion and, and just, you know, go out there and do what we should be doing. How are you going to get your patients once uh, you're up and running? Is that something people can refer in, or is it only going to be people from the local vicinity? How, how's that going to work? Um, there's people can refer in. I know, um, I, I, and I've been around Ohio, California, Kansas, and it's all the same because people, people, you don't see babies on the street. You don't CPS intervenes and take them. So where these where are people coming from? Either you're getting released from an institution you know, or you're losing your job, you're, you're, there's a funnel going in there. And so one of the things is, how do I stop that funnel? And so hospitals can refer to us, homeless shuttles, homeless shelters can refer to us. Um, in, you want them in, to have said treatment first, though, stabilize treatment, detox first, yeah? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. At, at least yeah. at least a good uh, two weeks, at least. You yeah. know, after that, yeah. then I could probably manage with coordinating with a lot of other different services, you know, involved. I know um, I work at a local hospital here and I've been discussing it with everybody in this community and everybody wants to do it. But the minute I put the hat out there and say, OK, we'll put something in, it's like, eh, you know, and mm -hmm. so and that's OK, because I am not a quitter. Uh, that's one thing I am. I am not a quitter. I, I put always laugh because thank God. I turned into a drug addict because I know how to get what I want, no matter what. And that same philosophy is going towards structuring this program, you know, and I don't care if that's, I have to get enough, you know, get enough credentials to say, listen to me. OK, I have a master's degree. Can you hear yeah. me now? You know, and yeah. and 
I'm just out here doing the thing and I and I'm and I'm passionate about it. And once this gets done, then I'm gonna come back to California and go, look, LA, this is how you do it. Oh, dude, yeah. I, I I that'll be so exciting if we could do that. Uh out here in Squaresville where you live now. <laughs> Squaresville, <laughs> Squaresville is a trip, Dr. Drew. I mean, I got I got sober, I got my mind right, and I'm like, what the heck is going on? You know? <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> it it really? is a trip. But uh, <laughs> you, know. you got sober at an interesting time. So uh, <laughs> I promised people I would uh, do a little tour of our my place here. My you're, you're in, I'm in my office right now. I'm going to see if I can do this. I don't know if I can. Uh, sorry about this. So there's all my since it's you, Anthony. I feel kind of like I should do it. This is uh, all my diplomas all over the place here. Give me a second. Let's see. Okay, there's some <laughs> over there and stuff. And I'm crawling over wires, and um, I'll just take you quickly, quickly down the hall here. This is where my staff works. Here, can't really see anything, can you? This is our waiting room. Yeah. You can see that. Oh, you can see my little my lab here. Let me turn the lights on. Okay, hold on. That's a that is a lab. I don't know if you can see what's up on the walls there. And then all kinds of you know, stuff. <laughs> nah, a couple of little exam rooms here. Whoops. This is just like a exam room, basic stuff. You know. oh. So we keep yeah. it simple. See, Dr. Drew, uh, a real doctor. Cool. <laughs> yeah, you're a real doctor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of like this is the this is my uh can you see I can kind of see the waiting room and where the staff works and stuff. Here you go. Medical records in here behind me. Yeah, you can't really see that. Anyway, we get we make do in a very small space here, and it works for us. So I've been here many, many, many years. Um, well, Anthony, listen, you know I'm a super fan, and you have my full support at all times. Um, so I'm asking for the Ask Dr. Drew community that we have built here to uh, get behind Anthony however you can. Uh, and, you know, he, he needs lots of different support in a lot of different ways. So, so just kind of go on the website, Anthony Howard Brown, see what you can do to uh, be of use. And um, when you're out here or I'm in Ohio, uh, come see us and then get the book. Get the book. That's he can then the proceeds from the book go right to Brown Matter, Park Bench to Park Avenue. And it's a uh, his story is spec. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. It's a great story, and uh, it's it's so inspirational. Um, and and the, one of the reasons he and I got involved was when he was a director of nursing at a psychiatric facility. And I, and I was just like, oh my goodness, I know what that means to be a director of nursing. That is no BS. That is a serious job. And not just anybody gets those jobs. So I could see immediately how far you would come. And uh, then as I got to know you, it's, you know, I, I know exactly, uh, the, the, uh, how you got there. And it's a privilege to be your friend, to call you a friend, and to witness uh, your continued success. So, anthonyhowardbrown.com, Brown Manor supported. Anthony, we'll talk soon. All right. Thanks, Dr. Drew. All right, you got it. Uh, and uh, Caleb, are we good otherwise? This has been quite an interesting little experience to, yeah, it's, to it's do a it great, this way. It's a great like inside look at your, your office over here. Yeah. <laughs> you've, you've, never, you've never been here either. Uh-uh. I haven't uh, been there either. Yeah, there's the upcoming schedule. Up. Salty Cracker in here next week. Naomi Wolf, Tom Renz, Donald Trump Jr., Mike Lindell. Uh, 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 Emily Barsh is hard at work. Some crazy stuff coming your way. Uh, do sign up uh, at the Rumble channel uh, if you don't mind. Mike Benz, I swear to God, I could do I could do three hours with Mike Benz and then another three hours with uh, Matthias Desmond. Uh, the <laughs> two of them, they're just they're just they're just helping me understand reality because. It, it, you know, before discussing things with them, I, I found things very confusing. At least they're kind of making sense of things. So uh, I have to run right now. Uh, it is Wednesday. I've got, uh, we're doing a show called Health Uncensored that'll be on Fox Business Channel uh, and another show uh, for Discovery ID I'll be filming also. So I'm going to be busy for the next few days, but we'll pick back up again. Is it uh, Tuesday we pick back up? April 22nd. Let's Let double check, check what that is. Let me pull up my... Calendar. That's a Monday, actually. So we're doing Monday coming up with Salty Cracker, and that's going to be back at the regular time, oh, 3 p.m. Yeah. Pacific. Yeah, so it's Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday next week we're doing shows. Uh, the reason is we've got a family thing coming up. Yeah. So, all right. 
Uh, excellent. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, and we will see you Monday. And that is at 3 o'clock, correct, Caleb? Yep, that's correct. All right. We will see you then. Thanks, everybody, for putting up with our little uh, interesting uh, experiment today. Uh, hope you learned something. And uh, we will see you on Monday at 3 o'clock. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com help.